just a minute ha i'll start hello start yeah uh so good evening friends amongst us we have senior advocate amit kumar deshpande who has already done one session with us and trickram and associates is our knowledge partner of beyond law clc in this series of legal empowerment amongst the rural as well as the urban area so that we can have the resource persons who can make us understand the nuances of law and when we are talking of doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel as contemplated under section 43 of the transfer of property act we requested mr amit that you have to feed the knowledge amongst the people so that it can be transferred in the right perspective and therefore he was kind enough we gave him a short notice and he read really agreed that is one of the hallmarks of all the resource persons who have come across on the beyond law clc that they have always been kind enough even at a short notice they can share the knowledge being a sunday i will request straight away to trikram to sh- give a sh- short intro and thereafter amit will take their things forward mute and mute through it thank you so much mr vikas chatrat and uh, senior advocate amit kumar deshpande sir thank you so much uh, for accepting our invite and as mr vikas chatrat rightly said in a short notice you have agreed so we are so grateful and i don't want to take much time over to you thank you vikas ji and thank you trivikram thanks all the uh, audience here uh, especially already knowledgeable audience here for giving me another opportunity to share a little bit of the knowledge which i have acquired through reading and my experiences so uh, all uh, senior and uh, friend colleagues here see so this doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel is essentially a doctrine of equity and the foundation of this doctrine which is applied in india dates back again to the english law and the judgments and the equitable principles that equity principles that the english courts have enunciated through variety of judgments to uh, come directly to the point in cases of person persons who contract to sell property but with no title the purchaser can take advantage of the subsequent acquisition of such title by the vendor and the law compels the vendor to convey the property if by a supervening act or otherwise his imperfect title or no title is perfected this in short is the well known principle of feeding the grant by estoppel now this doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel is essentially based partly on the common law doctrine of estoppel by deed and partly on the equitable doctrine of estoppel by representation uh, as you can find it out estoppel by representation was at the earliest probably enunciated in 1837 judgment in a judgment of the year 1837 named picard versus shares which is explained subsequently in 1893 in a calcutta judgment in the case of sharat chandra versus gopal chandra this is reported in 1893 ilr 20 calcutta page 296 sharat chandra versus gopal chandra so this doctrine partly based on the estoppel by deed and partly based on the equitable doctrine of estoppel by representation in english law has been understood as thus i can explain a little the english law says where a grantor has purported to grant an interest in land which he did not at the time possess but subsequently acquires the benefit of his subsequent acquisition goes automatically to the earlier grantee or as it is usually ex- expressed feeds the estoppel now this is what we come across as the doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel 
however the english doctrine of feeding the estopel feeding the grant by estopel where i mentioned that it automatically inures to the benefit of the earlier grantee the subsequent acquisition of title by the vendor at automatically inures to the benefit of the grantee is a little at variance when it comes to application in india so far as the indian law is concerned this doctrine can be found more reference to be made to section 43 of the transfer of property act 1884 just for our proper understanding let us read what section 43 of the transfer of property act says it says where a person fraudulently or erroneously represents that he is authorized to transfer certain immovable property and professes to transfer such property for consideration such transfer shall at the option of the transferee operate on any interest which the transferor may acquire in such property at any time during which the contract of transfer subsists nothing in this section shall impair the right of transferees in good faith for consideration without notice of the existence of the said option it is also important to read the illustration to this section it reads thus a a hindu who has separated from his father b sells to c three fields x y and z representing that a is authorized to transfer the same of these fields z does not belong to a it having been retained by b on the partition but on b is dying a as heir obtains z c not having resigned at the contract of sale may require a to deliver z to him so this illustration very cleanly explains how this provision of section 43 of the transfer of property act actually operates in the realm of the practical transfers of property in a judgment of the honorable supreme court of india reported in air 1962 supreme court 847 this is the most celebrated judgment one of the leading judgments it is held that this section 43 of the transfer of property act embodies the rule of estoppel and enacts that a person who makes a representation shall not be heard to allege the contrary as against a person who acts on such representation now see each word that i am using i'm saying has its own impact in the proper understanding of this provision and this doctrine therefore we need to understand the the importance of every word that this section employs because in india it's not just the judgments but the provisions of law and its proper understanding as interpreted by the judgments which would be more applicable to understand this concept of the doctrine of the uh, feeding the grant by estoppel we can also read about a judgment reported in air 1921 privy council page 112 this is in the case of tilak dhari lal versus khedan lal where the privy council through lord buckmaster states if a man who has no title whatever to the property grants it by a conveyance which in form would carry the legal estate and he subsequently acquires an interest sufficient to satisfy the grant the estate instantly passes now to understand what actually is the equitable doctrine the three old decisions english decisions in the case of holroyd versus marshall of the year 1862 in case of collier versus isaacs in the year 1881 and talibai versus official receiver of the year 1888 which enunciate the doc equitable doctrine which regards that as done which ought to be done now as i have uh, told the provisions of section 43 of the transfer of property act 
speaks about a representation by the transferer that he is authorized to transfer certain immobile property and such representation being a fraudulent or erroneous representation see this representation is required to be either fraudulent or erroneous if it is not fraudulent or erroneous the provisions of section 43 would not apply at all and with such fraudulent or erroneous representation the transferer professes to transfer such property for consideration so please note consideration the transfer must be for consideration the transfer must be for trans uh, consideration which would only then make the provision applicable then if the transfer is made by a person who did not have the authority to transfer at the time when the transfer was made but who makes a, a, a fraudulent or erroneous representation about his having such authority to transfer and the transferee obtains the transfer upon consideration and if such transfer or the vendor acquires title subsequently in such property then at the option of the transferee mark this also it is at the option of the transferee the contract must subsist that is at the option of the transferee when the contract is subsisting when subsequently the vendor acquires title the transferee gets the interest that the transferor has subsequently acquired so therefore it is important to note that for the purpose of operation of section 43 we have to understand that it is the transferee who is given the option to get the benefit and it is only during the subsistence of the contract of transfer that such option can be actually exercised by the transferee the essential conditions however for the operation of this section are two very importantly we have to understand that the contract has to be made by a competent person that is the transferer must be a person who is competent to contract to enter into the contract of transfer secondly that the contract subsists when the claim for recovery of property is made by the transferee therefore we can now have we can understand that if the contract is made by a minor or a lunatic then it is not a contract by a competent person in law and hence section 43 cannot be availed by the transferee similarly let us assume that there is a prohibition in law to sell the property or to sell the property only after obtaining previous sanction or permission then if the if the transfer is made without such previous permission or sanction as is required in law then the transferer is not competent to transfer and hence the provisions of section 43 would be applicable or not have has to be seen in the light of the particular words used in section 43 i have also mentioned that the transfer as contemplated under section 43 of the act is a transfer for consideration and therefore it has to be kept in mind that a transfer which is not essentially for any consideration would not be governed by the provisions of section 43 for example a gift therefore a person who gifts the property cannot come within the realm of section 43 of the act there are various other examples which i would be explaining little later as i had stated that the first of the references made to the equitable doctrine of estoppel is made is found in these three decisions english decisions in the year 1862 1881 and 1888 the privy council in 1921 have uh, having also mentioned about this 
the provisions of section 43 being different from the equitable doctrines that are found in english law the judgment in the reported in ir 1962 supreme court 847 has to be read for a proper understanding of the indian perspective of this doctrine let us give you few examples of when this section is held to be applicable and when it is not applicable uh, friends this topic is very very small very short in fact there is not much to uh, elucidate on this topic because it is one of the fundamental doctrines which we all need to know since it's a fundamental doctrine but also important though it is short this topic is chosen to be uh, discussed separately uh, as one session i assume that this topic may not go beyond uh, 20 minutes of our discussion as we have uh, understood what is the the english background of this doctrine and how it is actually understood in the uh, context of the indian statute i would uh, make reference to one or two examples now let us uh, let us give an example of a vendor having sold the property as an agent of a hindu widow and then he himself becoming her heir in an old decision reported in 1893 a calcutta decision in the case of sayyid nurul husain versus shah sahai it is held that section 43 would not be operative obvious reason is that the vendor had sold it as an agent and therefore there is no question of the transferer saying that he fraudulently or erroneously represented about he being authorized it should be understood that prior to the 1929 amendment to the transfer of property act the words fraudulent were the word fraudulent was missing from this provision of section 43 and therefore there was a little confusion and the, debates in judicial decisions whether the error of representation referred in section 43 if it should be an innocent error or it should be a fraudulent error what would be the consequence whether section 43 would still govern and benefit the transferee upon the transferer obtaining subsequent to the transfer title or interest in the property if the representation was mere innocent error error was an erroneous erroneous representation and therefore in 1929 to put rest to such debates the amendment was made and the words fraudulent in addition to the word erroneously has been added to the provision and therefore it is now very clear that these two adjectives are more important for the purpose of operating section 43 itself so therefore representation has to be erroneous or fraudulent one other judgment in the case of kartar singh is also an instructive reading for all the audience here rendered by the honorable supreme court where uh, the question was whether the transferer should have acted innocently or not and what is the effect of uh, the transferee having the knowledge of such imperfect title or no title possessed by the transferer the honorable supreme court says that they goes on to discuss what is the effect of such uh, knowledge about the parties however there have been debates on this legal issue also as to when the transferee also has the knowledge that the transferer has no authority to transfer the property whether section 43 operates or not as i understand see practically if we have to understand the operation of section 43 and the practical aspects of sale or any other transfer if a purchaser knows that the transferer has no authority to transfer the property then obviously the purchaser would not purchase this property at all and therefore it would not be so relevant for us to 
understand whether section 43 would be applicable when the purchaser has the knowledge about the incapacity of the transferor to transfer the property. However, this becomes relevant only in two circumstances when the sale is a collusive sale between the transferor and the transferee in order to defeat certain provision of law. If the transaction, if the transfer is with a purpose to defeat the provision of law, then certainly the question with regard to the knowledge of the transferee about the transferor's incapacity would be a relevant factor. And therefore, we have to understand that section 43 would not be applicable at all to the benefit of the transferee if the transfer was with an intention to defraud or defeat the provision of law. Since there is no estoppel when the truth is known to both the parties, unless there is an erroneous or fraudulent representation. And hence, what I can say is that a false statement known to be so cannot be fraudulent and cannot be erroneous also. However, uh, this debate has now put, been put to rest by the uh, judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court, as I have mentioned earlier. In the case, in, in that judgment referred in the uh, case of Juma Masjid versus uh, Kodi Maniandra Devaya, reported in AIR 1992, Supreme Court 847. The Honorable Supreme Court has held that unless party acts on the erroneous or fraudulent representation, Section 43 would not be applicable. So therefore, what is important for us to understand is that the transferee must act on the erroneous or fraudulent representation of the transferor. If he doesn't act on that fraudulent representation, and if he already knows that fraudulent or erroneous fact that the transfer is transferor is purporting to mention, then there is absolutely no applicable provision, applicable doctrine under section 43 of the Act. Right from 1923 Privy Council, it has been held that the provisions of section 43 would not be applicable to the transactions that are prohibited by legislature. That is where we can uh, very profitably uh, read the decision of uh, His Lordship Justice Mukherjee in the case of Annada versus Gaur Mohan, reported in AIR 1923 Privy Council at page 189, where it has been it is discussed with regard to the effect of a transaction that is prohibited by legislature and the applicability of section 43. We can go to another example, an earlier example which I had given with regard to a vendor as agent of a Hindu widow selling the property and obtaining the title as an heir of that Hindu widow subsequently. Now, there is another interesting example which you all can understand. The example of two brothers mortgaging the land, though a cousin had half a share in the said property. And the two brothers having acquired that cousin's share by inheritance later, subsequently. Now the mortgagee, the mortgagee from the two brothers, obtains a decree for sale and purchases the property and sells it to a third party. Now the third party, it is held, did not get any benefit under the provisions of section 43 of the act as there was no erroneous or fraudulent representation made to him at all and therefore this again emphasizes that there has to be a representation fraudulently or erroneously made by the transferor without which there is no question of the applicability of section 43. We can also take another example of a head of a joint family head of a joint Hindu family who transfers the property, whether section 43 can be ben taken benefit of by the transferee if the head of the joint family subsequently acquires the full title 
to the property the answer by the judicial decisions is yes the head of the joint family is bound by section 43 now there are certain instances where uh, among various circumstances the uh, courts have held that the rule of estoppel under section 43 of the act that is the doctrine of feeding the grand estoppel is not applicable however we all have to also understand that the general principles of estoppel are enunciated also under section 115 115 of the indian evidence act and therefore though as contemplated under the provisions of section 43 of the transfer of property act the title cannot be claimed by the transferee yet under section 115 of the evidence act the transferor can be stopped from contending to the contrary after having represented that he had the authority to transfer the property and hence we have to understand section 43 vis a vis section 115 of the evidence act as to under which circumstances the general principles of estoppel under section 115 of the evidence act could be made applicable and under what circumstances the doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel under section 43 of the transfer of property act could be made applicable a another peculiar and interesting uh, example which we need to understand and emphasize is also where under section 14 of the hindu succession act where the hindu female is benefited with her title being perfected or fully blown into a full title if she is possessed of the property as on the date of the enactment though she had possessed the property only for a limited duration so whether the transfer of the property from such hindu female such transfer also could take benefit of section 14 and take aid of section 43 of the transfer of property act or not the judicial decisions also indicate that the transfer from a hindu female probably would not be entitled to get the benefit under section 43 of the transfer of property act as i have also said section 115 of the act is to be understood separately but so far as a hindu females property which ripens into full ownership is concerned that would not be uh, governed by section 43 of the act of the transfer of property act this all of you can note is also found in the decision of the honorable supreme court in the case of natwar lal versus dadu bhai reported in air 1954 supreme court page 61 however the law can still be developed uh, by taking recourse to various other circumstances in the in in other statutory uh, laws but nonetheless as it stands today these decisions should be quite helpful for us to have little more insights into this development of the doctrine Now, as the specific relief act is concerned uh, anything vikas sir uh, you made some mention it's fine fine so far as the uh, specific relief act is concerned see there under section 13 of the specific relief act there is a provision which says that we the, the, the transferee or the prospective vendee can compel the uh, transferor and the subsequent transferee again to compel him to make good the transfer in his favor now whether section 43 applies to 
agreement for sale or not is another important factor that you all have to keep in mind but the provisions of section 43 are very clear it says in cases of persons who contract to sell property the purchaser can take the advantage of the subsequent acquisition of title so therefore section 43 operates in this zone while section 13 operates is, operates in another zone altogether and therefore that provision also could profitably be read and understood for the purpose of our active assistance to the honorable courts of law in the country with uh, this much of understanding of the provisions of section 43 and the doctrine of feeding the grant by estoppel i think it would be sufficient for us to now make a further study so that we use these principles appropriately in all individual cases which you all might have to use in one decision reported in AIR 1996 Supreme Court page 2773 in the case of Jot Singh versus Ramdas Mahato the Honorable Supreme Court holds that the provisions of section 43 are not applicable to auction sales that obviously would also mean that it is not applicable to execution proceedings then the reason is obvious that the sale or the transfer referred in section 43 of the transfer of property act is essentially a transfer only by voluntary sales and hence auction sales are held not to be voluntary sales and there is no question of the vendor making any representation as such to the transfer there therefore this provision has to be understood in all the light of all these explanations that we find quite uh, clearly enunciated in the very wordings of the section itself with this i think uh, there's no nothing more for me to explain now however the concept of estoppel is a very wide concept which uh, needs a detailed discussion in a different session Therefore, Trivikram sir and uh, Mr. Vikas sir, yeah. we can have. There's one question posted on the group uh, on the WhatsApp. Yes, sir. If a husband buys the property, if normally normally uh, bank loan, and repayment has also been done by the husband, when they both and his wife is seeking not to interfere with the property, what can be done? If the husband sells the property, buys buys the property, buys the property in the name of his wife, okay, uh, with a bank loan, and repayment has also been done by the bank, question is not related with the uh, uh, today's session. See, it, it, it all depends upon the Benami Transactions Prohibition Act and uh, the interpretation of Section Four, the amendments made to Section Three and Four thereof, and th therefore this will be a separate. Uh, topic altogether to understand. So it's not uh, correlated with section uh, 43. Yatra Vikram, over to you. I'm just checking the box. I think uh, uh, I should, I should. Senior advocate has made it so I should, clear. That I should seek pardon from all the audience here. If I have uh, not come up to their expectations, especially Mr. Vikas and Trivikram sir. Also. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, what I was trying to convey is the senior advocate has tried to convey with so much clarity that they don't have doubts. That's what I was saying. <laughs> so before we I part from the Sanchan has joined. Sanchan, do you have any doubt? Is a brother in here who is practicing in Karnataka High Court? Hello, <laughs> uh, I just uh, had a uh, clarification, uh, if it is possible, uh, whether. Uh, the same is uh, said the difference between the agree sale agreement and sale deed and its applicability in section uh, of uh, section 43 so yes. because this was section 13 of uh, the so what is the 
I, I, I am I, yes, sir i just wanted to know uh, when a person contracts to sell and uh, uh, and he does not uh, and uh, later he he does not have a title as per um, and it, the applicability of section 43 applies however uh, he, it is only a contract to sell it is not a sale deed that uh, you had mentioned it sir but i couldn't uh, get uh, dot complete specific relief act in fact deals with that uh, separately and therefore uh, in in your situation where a person who contracts to sell without any authority and subsequently acquires title obviously he will be compelled by the court to specifically perform his part of the contract so that's how it, it is made applicable So, uh, thank you, Mr. Amit Pandey. The topic was elucidatedly explained. Mr. Vikram said that once there are no questions in the chat box, he hammers the point that you explained it in the right perspective. And on Wednesday, everyone can connect if they so de deem fit at 9 p.m. Social justice through legal services by Dr. M, who is the director of the CMR Schools of Law as well as Vidya Selvanani and in Karnataka High Court. So do stay connected with us. Everyone stay safe, stay blessed.